Swami Vivekananda used to say that the highest possibility available to man is to combine the intellect of Shankaracharya and heart of Buddha. Now, what was the reference point in Ramakrishna's life regarding Buddha? And secondly, uh, Advaita Vedanta has a basic premise that Brahman is the underlying reality substratum of everything and Buddhism says nothing. So how did Vivekananda reconcile these two aspects in his life? You see, first of all, let me be very honest. Swami Vivekananda loved Buddha so much from time to time he wanted to run away from Ramakrishna and follow the Buddhist path. From time, and once he ran away and went to Bodh Gaya, sat under the Bodhi tree and meditated and it is said that he had a spiritual, he had one of his guru bhais, one of his uh, fellow disciples with him, brother disciples with him and they both suddenly in the middle of the night sat under the Bodhi tree and both of them got charged up and they embraced each other and they were shedding tears of joy and they came back. What experience they have not told anybody. It remains a mystery. There was some, another incident in the life of Vivekananda when he was a young boy. Again, a very interesting incident. He said, one day, look, he's very candid. He would talk all these things frankly. He said, one day I was sitting and, uh, um, you know, because he would practice meditation at a young age, because it's so natural for him. It was a natural tendency to meditate. So he would try and meditate. Young boy, I don't know how old, maybe 14, 12, 14, like that. He was trying to meditate in a room. He said, suddenly I saw an appear, somebody, a, a figure appear in front of me uh, with holding a kamandalu and, and I, could, I could feel like a, like a monk appearing. And he said, I got frightened. Vivekananda got frightened. He said, the monk started to speak to me and I got so frightened, I jumped up, I ran out of the door and I didn't want to go. And after some time I said, ah, I suspect it was Buddha. This is what he has surmised. So he had tremendous attraction to Buddha and Buddhism. Do you know why it is necessary? Again, there was an image of Buddha in Ramakrishna's room. So Ramakrishna, even though there is no great reference to Buddhism or this kind of reconciling the philosophy of Buddhism with Hinduism, there was a natural affinity towards Buddha in both Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. And this particular saying that you said came out of Vivekananda. You see, with Adi Shankara, one criticism that can be leveled, here is a sharp intellect. One criticism that can be leveled at Adi Shankara is terrible for a little tid tiddler like me to try and make a critical comment about Adi Shankara, the great Adi Shankara who rescued Hinduism from complete you know, denigration. It would be very foolish for me to pass, but this I am just borrowing from Swami Vivekananda. He said the only thing is he had a, his heart was not that broad. Buddha had a heart that was so broad, so compassionate. What Buddha did is this. What Adi Shankara was dishing out to the elite. You know, you need to be like that and Brahmin and this and that before you can even study the Vedas. That was the elitist movement. With, with, Brahm, with Buddha came the idea of presenting spirituality in the marketplace, make it available to the whole of humanity. First time, that big heart, compassionate heart of Buddha. That's why he said, if you can combine the, in the sharp intellect of Adi Shankara and the compassion of Buddha, we have a complete personality, a very comprehensive personality. Do you know why I like to do this? I person, and this is, look, Vivekan is my mentor. I can say stuff like that on TV. He combines the two. This Vivekanan combines the two. Because I see his heart bleeding for humanity, not searching for personal salvation. At the same time, I see the intellect of Adi Shankara in his teachings, in his, in, in, in his lectures. That is why people sometimes struggle to understand uh, Vivekanan. Then they study the, the complete works of Swami Vivekanan. They start reading. They shudder and say, what language? What is he on about? Because he's very incisive, very sharp. Unless you are of that equal caliber, you will struggle. This is a problem. But here the sharp intellect of Adi Shankara and, the, and if you like this, compassion of Buddha combined in one life. That is why I love this man. If he was just pure intellectual, I don't think he would be bothered. Look, I'm not attracted to Adi Shankara because the compassion was missing. Here I see this broad man, this man with this vision. He would give anything away. And remember I started the story of Vivek and I said, one of the names of Shiva is Ashutosh, who gives things away. Who is, who is a giver? Who doesn't do business with you? He just gives away. Shiva. When I look at the image of Vivekananda sitting in meditation, I say, ah, this is a piece of Shiva that fell down to earth. Here is nothing but manifestation of this broad vision of Shiva, Ashutosh, giving away. Compassion of 
Vivekananda. How do we reconcile this philosophic issue? You see, I will do a short job rather than a lengthy one. You see, when you study esoteric Hinduism and you study Buddhism, not in, in a doctrinal sense, but in a, a, an experiential sense, you see, the, you see the, 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 the reconciliation. The reconciliation between esoteric Hinduism or non-theistic Hinduism means not reference to any god or theo sitting behind, but the idea of Brahman. Esoteric Hinduism and esoteric Buddhism meet at experiential level. Let me explain. And Vivekananda has commented on this. He said, Buddhism is not a nihilistic religion. Nihilistic means believe in nothingness, zero. It appears as nihilistic because this is, if you like, the doctrinal interpretation. Buddhism, and in fact, you can't distinguish between esoteric Hindu or Advait and Buddhism when you look at the depth. In fact, sometimes they say Adi Shankara is a crypto Buddhist. He was using the Buddhist philosophy except he was using the Hindu vocabulary. He is sometimes classified as a crypto Buddhist. So, the, at, at experiential level, they are saying, let me, let me try and explain what I mean. You see, the experience of Brahman, the experience of spirituality, kind of defies every classification. Intellectual classification, every attempt I make to try and you know put my clothes in it and control it or try and encapsulate it within my own system of thinking, every time I try it fails miserably, it fails miserably. So the way the Veda say is neti neti, not this, not this, none of these things can really capture the, the essence of Brahman. So the word they use neti neti, not this, not this. Now when you look at Buddhism and this idea that really the exp at the experiential level, you see the thing is something that I cannot um, you know, put words to, give words to. So it appears as nihilism, means believe in nothingness. And the, the, the esoteric Hinduism also use the same vocabulary, neti, neti, cries the Vedas. This thing defies every linguistic attempts to capture it. It will always fail, it has to fail. Why does it have to fail? You might say, why is it such nonsense? Why is it such a tricky chap? Look, this is the thing that is underpinning everything. It manifests itself as all this multi-layered universe. And in this multi-layered universe, you have the physical level, you have the mental level, you've got the intellectual level. See, these are like waves and waves within waves. And we are trying to understand the universe just playing with the waves. But the thing that is underpinning the ocean is not the waves and we cannot get caught up with the waves. Every linguistic attempt is in a way trying to capture something that defies any kind of classification. So we struggle, the Buddhists struggle and that is why sometimes the Buddhists are criticized for being a nihilistic religion and Vivekananda says it is not a nihilistic religion at all. It is struggling with the same concept the Hindus have been struggling, trying to classify the unclassifiable. So this is, if you like, the same struggle. And why do I say at experiential level the same? Look, if you, for example, when you have a spiritual experience, the mental mode that you have or your interface that you have in order for you to interpret your spiritual experience will come into play. It cannot be otherwise. Suppose you got this television screen, big television screen. The resolution power, suppose you are getting a picture on the television screen. The resolution power, how many dots per inch there are, will automatically become visible in the picture because when you look at the picture, when you get closer to the picture, you see all the little dots. So your resolution will become Im, you know, Im, Im, implanted in the way you are seeing the picture. It cannot be otherwise. In the same way, whenever we try and encapsulate spirituality, the mental frame or the mental mode that we possess is going to show up, it's going to color it, it's going to interfere. We cannot do it otherwise. We cannot relate to the absolute because we will use our relative frame to relate to the absolute. We cannot do otherwise. So when, say, a person will actually think God like a personality, oh look, I'm like Mother Goddess. My spiritual experience will be colored as the Mother Goddess. I will see her, and not my imagination. I will see her more real than I see you here. I'll interact with her much more dramatically, intensely than the level with, with which I live with you. That will be that dramatic. Suppose I say, no, I don't care for Mother Goddess. I like to think of myself as the self. I am the self. I am the Atman. When I have my spiritual experience, when I try and give it expression, find words for it, I will say, I won't see Mother Goddesses appearing, otherwise I'm in a mess. My, if you like, if you like this interface is already focusing on the idea of Atman, 
So there is no personality standing there, no God standing there. So my experience will be, will use language, expression, will you talk of a great light. And again when you look at Buddha, you see look at the language uses. He says, my spiritual experience is just a state of Buddha, state of enlightenment. Same the Hindus say, the light of the Gayatri, Buddha calls enlightenment, state of Buddhahood. At the experiential level, they meet up. At the level of expression, they part company. At the level of interpretation and doctrine, they come at loggerheads with each other. We seem to be talking different language. At the deep, you see, look, again, you see, come back to the same idea. Unless religion is something that you experience for yourself, all these doubts will remain and they should not be considered to be a villain. The doubts are not villain. The doubts are the prods that are telling you, come on, experience, then you will get your solution. So the doubts are in a way the best thing that we possess because it will force us to dig deeper. So let the doubts remain, don't vilify them, but try and resolve the doubts and the only way you resolve them is through first an experience. And this is what both Hinduism and Buddhism would, would promote.